Okay, so tonight is the May full moon night. In Pali it's called Visaka Punyamasa and in Sinhala it's called Vesak Poya. It's from the singular that we get the common name for the celebration now as Vesak. And today uh, we celebrate three things mainly, which is the birth, the awakening and the passing of Lord Buddha. So these three things put together in a way summarize the life of the Buddha as well because they cover the three periods. Now there's a kind of problem about where to start when we're talking about the life of the Buddha because in Buddhism we don't feel like a person's life stream is just confined to one life but it goes through many lives. Um, you know, while we were doing the renovations, we put up the 28 Buddhas. It starts at here, comes up here, and then goes down here. So, our Lord Buddha, who is the 28th over here, he made his aspiration to become a Buddha under the fourth of the Buddhas over here, Deepankara. Yeah. That's 24 Buddhas before our Lord Buddha because the Lord Buddha uh, was traveling in samsara for four incalculable periods and for a hundred thousand aeons. So it's a very, very long time. And under each of these Buddhas, the 24 who preceded our Lord Gotama Buddha, he confirmed the aspiration that he would become uh, a Buddha in the end. At the time of Deepankara Buddha, he was known as Sume uh, Sumedha. And then he did something rather wonderful. He was already a very uh, developed ascetic as Sumedha. He had the uh, abhinyas and the jhanas. He was very uh, well developed in the spiritual life. But he heard that a Buddha had arisen in the world and that people were preparing to welcome him to the city. So he decided to also join in and to help with the preparations. And then as the Buddha Deepankara was coming along, he made a bridge out of his own body for the Buddha to pass over uh, a pool of water and mud so the Buddha's feet would not become dirtied or anything. And after that, he made his aspiration uh, to become a Buddha at some time in the future. And Lord uh, Buddha Deepankara confirmed that aspiration. Then for all that time, a really long time, so many hundreds of thousands of aeons and then incalculable periods which are longer than those periods, he was practicing the perfections, the parami, uh, during this long sojourn in samsara. His last life he was known as Vesantara and it's in his life as Vesantara that he completed the paramis. That means he had fulfilled all of the paramis. There's ten paramis in uh, our, the way we see it in our tradition. There are ten paramis and the last one that was completed was the dana parami and uh, Vesantara, through his great generosity, it's sometimes known, the story is sometimes known as the great generosity of Vesantara. So through his great um, um, generosity, then he fulfilled the final 
one of the Paramis. And after that, he was reborn in Tusita heaven. That's a high heaven. Uh, as the Deva Santusita. He's sometimes called Santusita. He's sometimes identified as Saitaketu. Saitaketu means like white banner or white flag. Uh, but he was reborn there, and it's a dhammata. It means it's um, something that always occurs that the Buddha, uh, sorry, the Bodhisattva, in his last life, before he takes rebirth on as a human in his last life, he is in Tusita heaven as a deva. And now we understand also that the next Buddha, that means Metteya Buddha, is also now in Tusita heaven. And, you know, in Tusita heaven, the time periods are very, very long. Okay. So he will be reborn at a far distant time in the future and will eventually uh, become Metteya Buddha. Now the guards who were in, uh, in Tusita heaven decided to request the Bodhisattva to take rebirth in his last life. Yeah. So they uh, gathered around all the guards, not only from Tusita heaven but from many of the other heavens, gathered round and they asked Santusita if he was ready and prepared to take birth again for the good of the uh, people uh, and for the good of all beings and then become a Buddha and give the Dhamma teaching. So the Bodhisattva had to make certain investigations to see if it was the right time and everything. One of the investigations is the right time. Another of the investigations is whether he, the, the continent was suitable. So the continent is what in those days was called Jambudipa. It's what we now call India. Yeah. So that was the right continent. It's understood that the Buddhas always get reborn in Jambudipa. Then the right people, he had to find the right people, so the right people were the Sakyans, small people really, on the edge of the Himalaya. And then the right family, which was King Sudodana's family. And then to check the mother's lifespan. So this was also important because it's another Dhammata, it's another uh, thing that always happens is that the Buddha's, the Bodhisattva's mother lives just for the period of the pregnancy and one week later she passes away. So they had to know the right time as well. So investigating all these things he found that uh, all of these things were right and were um, set up for the right occasion. And that was the July full moon night. Yeah? And it was at the end of a 10-day festival that was taking place before the Asala full moon night. And the king and the family had been engaged in this festival, leading the festival, which was an important, if you like, midsummer festival that was taking place before the Asala full moon, which is, if you think about it, ten lunar moons before Vesak. Yeah. So it was on that night that Queen Maya, who was the principal queen of King Sudodana, had a dream. And the dream is like a presage of the future and of what was to happen. And so she dreamed that the four great kings, those are the lower dwelling uh, devas, just above our world, 
the four great kings uh, came down and they picked her up on the couch that she was reclining on and took her to the Himalayas. And then the queens of the four great kings, they bathed Mahamaya and it's like a purification rite, if you like, to make, to make sure she's clean and that she's pure. And then she dreamt that a white elephant appeared and, and came closer and closer to her and then entered through the right side. Later we will see when the, Lord, when the Bodhisattva is born, he is also born from the right side. So the elephant is uh, also a very powerful being. And in Pali, there's a word, Naga. You've heard of Naga. This word Naga, it means many different things. One of the things it means is a cobra. A cobra is a very powerful being. It can bring your life to an end in very short order. An elephant is also called a Naga because it's such a powerful being, the largest creature uh, in the jungle, really. And then uh, an Arahat is also called a Naga because an Arahat is the most powerful of the human beings like this. So the, the Bodhisattva appeared as an elephant and as a white elephant. White is the sign of purity. Elephant is the sign of power. And then entered into her womb through the right hand side. So she had this dream and at the same time Santusita who was in Tusita heaven, descended from Nandana Vanna, from the Nandana grove, and entered into Mahamaya's womb as the, you know, during the conception as the being who would be born and would be known later as Siddhartha. Okay, in the morning she went to the king and she told about the dream that she'd had and then they called the Brahmins, the Brahmins at court, the priests who were at court who could interpret the dreams and so on, called the uh, Brahmins uh, to interpret the dream and so the Brahmins were able to interpret that it meant that she was now uh, pregnant and pregnant with uh, a great being who would be born, who would be the son, the son and heir of King Sudodana. Now there's some other quite wonderful things that are said about this pregnancy. For instance, it's said that while the uh, Bodhisattva was in the womb, that he always sat in cross-legged position, taking up the position that he would take at the foot of the Bodhi tree later. Again, you see, it's an auspicious sign, if you like. And then, uh, because the Bodhisattva is sat in the womb, yeah, it's like the womb is a chaitya, like it's a stupa. It's a relic chamber. The relic, of course, is going to be the Buddha, eventually. And the womb is like the chamber that is containing the, uh, the fetus that would become this great being. And the devas, during the pregnancy period, also kept watch over the queen to make sure that she was safe and comfortable and uh, was kept in a, you know, free from disturbance and so on and so forth like this. And the queen herself was from the time that she conceived, she was morally pure. 
It means n not breaking the precepts, not breaking the five precepts, having no sensual desire during that time. And uh, then, you see, all of these things you can understand as signs of the special being that is going to be born at a later time. Now then, when we come to the delivery in the ancient India, it was customary for women to give birth in their maternal home. It's probably actually a relic from the time when there was not patriarchy, but matriarchy. And the lineage would go down through the uh, women, not go down through the men. So it's probably a relic of that time. But the, uh, the delivery was supposed to take place in the matriarchal home. So when it came time for the, or when it was approaching time, then Queen Mahamaya asked if she could return to her home in Devadaha. Uh, that's her home. The king's home is in Kapilavatu, so there's some distance between these places. And then the king arranged everything, that there would be a chariot, and that she would have attendants, and that there would be guards, and they set off towards Devadaha. But on the way, they came to a, a small grove that was between the two cities, the Kapilavattu and Devadaha. That place is called Lumbini. We now know it as Lumbini in what is now Nepal. Of course, there was no Nepal and there was no India at that time. But uh, it was just a, a grove, a beautiful grove. They give really, in the commentaries, they give these really beautiful descriptions of the grove, you know, with the birds and the bees and the flowers and the uh, everywhere being really uh, spectacularly beautiful and everything. But when they got to this grove, Mahamaya wanted to go into the grove and uh, spend time there. But when she got there, then the signs of delivery came on. And as she lifted up her hand, then the tree bent down a branch like this. And she held onto the branch. And while standing, she gave birth to the child. And the birth, it said, is not like a normal birth, which is, you know, is uh, very unclean and very impure. But the birth of the Bodhisattva, of course, cannot be unclean, it cannot be impure. It was done very easily without the normal birth pains and it was done very cleanly without the normal accompanying um, uh, you know, mess, if you like. But anyway, when the Bodhisattva was born, then he was first received by the Brahma kings uh, the Mahabrahmas, and then he was passed to the four great kings, and then he was passed on to silk, uh, which was held by the queen's, uh, by the queen's attendants, and that's how he was born. And you know, we've set up at the Chaitya, we set up the Bodhisattva every year and we do the bathing of the bodhisattva isn't it right this is because when the bodhisattva was born then it said two springs of water one hot water one cold water were poured magically if you like were poured magically over the bodhisattva uh, at the very right temperature and everything and kind of gave him a magical bath. So when we bathe the uh, Bodhisattva at the uh, Chaitya, 
Yeah, that's what it's emulating. That's what it's doing. It's celebrating the birth, of pure being, and then being washed. Okay, that took place on Vesak day in traditional time, 623 BC, 623 BC. And in the commentaries, they even worked out the day, and the day was a Friday. Okay, so on Friday, 623 BC, then the Bodhisattva was born. And then, miraculously, because all of these stories about the Bodhisattva, of course, have this miraculous element, miraculously, the Bodhisattva was able to walk as soon as he was born. And he first faced to the east, and then he faced to the south, he faced to the west, he faced to the north, and he took seven steps. And then he said, you know, we see with the Bodhisattva, he's like this. This is because when he said this, he did like this. And he said, I am the greatest in the world. I am the elder in the world. I am the best in the world. This is my last birth. There is no more becoming for me. You see, again, it's like a prophecy of what would come later when he attained awakening and he would not be reborn again. He would become the greatest person in the world, which is in fact what happened, of course. Of course, it's, it, you know, these things are like miraculous foretellings and things, but they have great meaning, I think, if you understand the sim symbolism uh, that is implied in them. So he said like this, and then there was, at the time of the birth, there were also, they say, 32 wondrous things happened. I can't tell you all 32 wondrous things, but they're things like, you know, the blind could see, the deaf could hear, the dumb could speak, the lame could walk, the fires in hell went out. And the lights in hell came on. I think this is an interesting one myself because it said that in hell, not one being who is suffering can actually see another being who is suffering. There's no companionship in hell, you know. Nobody knows that anybody else is there. They cannot see each other. But at the time that the Bodhisattva was born, they could all see each other and know that they had companions. I think it's also really uh, quite meaningful, you see. Okay, another thing that happened at the time of the Bodhisattva's birth is that there were seven others born at the same day. Seven other, uh, they're called co-natals means sahajata, it means they uh, appear on the same day. So one is Yasodhara, who would become the Bodhisattva's wife later. Yeah. Another is Ananda, who would be the Buddha's chief attendant. He was born on the same day. Another is Kaludayi. I told you Kaludai's story, I think last time we were uh, discussing the full moons. And Kaludai was the person who invited uh, the Buddha, after he had attained awakening, to go back to his hometown and to give teachings in his hometown. And then Channa and Kantaka. Channa is the groom and Kantaka is the horse on which the Bodhisattva uh, left from Kapilavattu and went on his great renunciation. And then also the Bodhi tree that the Lord Buddha would sit under 
was also appeared on the same day. And then four golden jars also appeared on the same day. So um, these are also wondrous things. It gives them some really close and like heart connection between these special people who figure in the life of Lord Buddha. Right? Now the newborn baby, after he had uh, done this walk and told about how he was the greatest in the world, he was taken to the uh, to the ascetic Kalu Devia, who was the king's chief advisor. Yeah. And the king wanted to make the newborn baby worship, you know, the most uh, spiritually appreciated person in the household, you can say like this, who was Kalu Devia. Um, but when they brought him into the presence of this great ascetic, right, and they were trying to make him bow down, instead of his head coming down, his feet came up and his feet were put on the head of the ascetic, like this. Because the bodhisattva, you see, is more... Uh, is in a higher state than even the ascetic Kaludevia, you see. And it said, if, if by chance, then the Bodhisattva had of uh, worship Kaludevia, then Kaludevia's head would have split into seven pieces. Yeah. Because, you know, the Bodhisattva is such a superior being, having spent all this time fulfilling the perfections in samsara. But it happened the other way round, you see, that the feet of the bodhisattva were put on the head of Kaludevila. Okay, and Kaludevila at that time was really astonished, of course, and he worshipped uh, the bodhisattva. And then he laughed, and then he cried. And the king, when he laughed, when the ascetic laughed, was very happy because it was so auspicious. And then when the ascetic cried, the king was very worried because it's very inauspicious. So he asked uh, Kalu Devila why he, why he laughed and why he cried. And he said, the reason that I laughed is because there was such a great joy in my heart because this, uh, this baby is the Bodhisattva and he will become the Buddha. In the end, he will become the Buddha. And why did I cry is because before he becomes the Buddha, I will die and I will never get the chance to meet him. And in fact, that's what's hap that is what happened. Kalu Devila actually died before the uh, Bodhisattva attained Buddhahood. And because of his great attainments, he had the uh, Binyas, he had the Jhanas and so on, the Samapatis, he was reborn in a high Brahma Loka. Okay? Then on the fifth day, after the birth, it come to the two events actually, which is the head washing ceremony, where it's like a consecration, you know, when they consecrated kings, but also with babies as well. They do a head washing uh, ceremony like this, and a name giving ceremony, the day that they gave the name. So when they gave the name, they gave the name Siddhatta, as you know. Siddhatta, it really means one who has accomplished his purpose. You can say like this anyway. One who has accomplished, Siddha means accomplished, and Atta, it actually has many meanings, but it means in, uh, in, in this uh, context, it means his 
aim or his purpose or his reason, his raison d'etre, his reason to be. So one who had accomplished his purpose, Siddhartha. And then they called in the seven Brahmins. And the seven Brahmin leaders in the household came and then they saw on the Bodhisattva's body the 32 marks of a great man. Yeah. I also cannot tell you about these great marks because too many you see. There's 32 great marks and there's 80 minor marks. But you know when you see uh, the Lord Buddha like, like he is here, uh, some of those marks are taken from the uh, description. Okay. And then they predicted, six of them said, the king asked what will become yeah, of this baby. And then they predicted that the baby would either become a Chakawati king, a universal monarch who would rule over the uh, continents, rule over the four continents, or if he went forth from the household life, then he would become a Buddha. But the seventh one, who was Kondanya, who will appear again later in our story, Kondanya said, no, there is not two destinies for this boy. He will not become a Chakravati, universal monarch. He will become a Buddha. Actually, Kondanya is the person we know as Anya Kandanya, who was one of the five ascetics who uh, was attendant on the Bodhisattva while he was doing his austerities and was the one of the group of five who heard the first teaching, the Dhammachakapavatana Sutta, and he is the first person who attained a, uh, the first stage of awakening on that Asala full moon night 30, uh, 35 years later. Yeah. And the other four were the sons of some of the other Brahmins who were present at that name giving ceremony. So they had children and four of them uh, were the other four ascetics uh, that joined the Bodhisattva. But that's getting ahead of the story a little bit. Okay. But you see, all of these things interconnected. And it's very interesting when you find out all these interconnections and how they all kind of fits together like some enormous uh, jigsaw puzzle. All these people related together, appearing at different times in the story like this. And they're all related and connected with each other. And not only in this life as well, but have been connected in previous lives. It's one of the wonderful things that you find if you read the Jataka stories. Nobody reads the Jataka stories, unfortunately, these days. But you find that the people that we know in the Buddha's last life were also with him in his previous lives. So the, the obvious one, the great one, of course, is Yasodhara, who became his wife in his last life. But she was many, many times she was his wife in previous lives. They had a heart connection, a spiritual connection that kept them together through many lives in samsara like this. But not only... Yasodhara, but with many of the other people who appeared in the Buddha's last life. And that's how it is in samsara. If you have a deep heart connection with people, then you get reborn with those people. On the seventh day, then Mahamaya passed away. Okay. 
you know, we saw during the time that Santusita was looking uh, for the right person to be the mother, then he saw that she would only last for ten lunar months and one week, and all the Bodhisattva's mothers, uh, according to the traditional understanding, pass away one week after giving birth. That's one way to understand it. But as you know, the Bodhisattva was actually born from the right-hand side, not from the vaginal canal, but from the right-hand side of the mother. And if you think about it, a different way of explaining this is that she was given a caesarean uh, operation and that the birth took place through caesarean section. And they did know of caesarean section at the time of the Lord Buddha. There's other reports of caesareans taking place, so we know that this is was taking place. But of course they were extremely dangerous for the mother. Yeah. And quite likely there is a nugget of historical truth in the stories and the legends that grew up. And it's quite possible that the uh, Bodhisattva was born by Caesarean section and the mother actually only lasted one week afterwards because it's a very traumatic operation. Now it's not, of course, but in those days it would have been a very traumatic operation. Uh, operation. But anyway, the uh, mother passed away. So that is the story of the birth of the Bodhisattva, which is one of the events that we commemorate at Vesak. Okay, now then, moving on from there, then we also have to take up the story and find out what happened between then and the awakening, which is the second uh, great event that took place at Vesak. So after Marmaya's passing, then her sister, who was also married to King Suddhodana, her younger sister was uh, Mahapajapati Gotami, and she took over the nursing of Siddhartha. She herself gave birth to the Buddha's younger brother, Nanda, three or four days after Siddhartha was born. So she was ready for nursing, but she gave out her own child to nurses, to the nurses in the palace, and she took for nursing Siddhartha. So Mahapajapati Gotami was not only the Buddha's auntie but also his foster mother and his uh, milk mother as well. We can say like that. Now the king of course wanted his son to be, you know, to succeed him and to be the king. And he had asked the Brahmins, you know, when they had said that he will either become a Chakravati universal monarch or he will become a Buddha, they, he asked them uh, what, would, um, what would make him go forth from the household life. And they told about the four signs. If he saw these four signs, then he would go forth from the household life. So the king from that period would not allow in the palace or around the palace anybody who was old, anybody who was sick, anybody who was dead, or any samana. A samana is like an ascetic. So he wouldn't allow these sites to come within the range of the Bodhisattva because these were the signs that the Bodhisattva would later see and it would spur him to become 
an ascetic himself. So the king built up this kind of protective environment around the Bodhisattva so that he would uh, be protected from the realities of the world, you can say. Okay. Now, one very important event that took part, I can't tell uh, all the events that uh, took place in the Bodhisattva's life because we have to move it on. But there's one very important event that um, refigures at the time of the awakening, and that was during the plowing festival. Now, as you know, in traditional peasant societies, these festivals are of great significance and of great importance. Yeah. They signify uh, something that is uh, taking place in the world that is of great moment, you can say. So the plowing festival is of great moment. If the plowing goes right, if the seeds are put in right in the earth, yeah. Later they come to fruition and later there's a good crop and everybody is reliant on there being sufficient food, on there being good crops. So the plowing festival is a very important festival, you see. So the king himself would lead the plowing festival. He went out and the way they describe it, the plow that the king used is made of gold. The plows that the ministers used, because the ministers also took place in this uh, festival, were made of silver. The plows that the normal people made used were made of iron, of course. And this is during the Iron Age. Lord Buddha was born during the early Iron Age in India. Yeah. So the king went out for the uh, festival and then while the king was uh, performing his function leading this uh, festival the bodhisattva was placed under a rose apple tree it's what you call in Malay jambu you know the jambu fruit so the jambu fruit is also where we get jambu Deeper from. Lord Buddha was born in Jambu Deeper. It's the continent where these Jambu fruits grow. Now, as you know, if you know anything about Jambu, and I'm sure some of you do, the tree is not actually very high or very tall, but it's tall enough for a young boy to sit under. So the nurses place the boy under the Jambu tree and then they went off to enjoy the festival and they left him there and then the Bodhisattva he sat again in cross-legged position under the tree with the shade of the tree over him and while he was sat in uh, cross-legged position he entered into the first jhana into the first absorption yeah. This becomes very important later when the Bodhisattva as an ascetic is trying to find the path to awakening. Yeah. So he sat there and while he was sat there it said that the sun went over, you know, it's going over the horizon, but the shadow didn't move. The shadow stayed over the Bodhisattva to protect him. In the different version of this story, in Lalita Wistara, which is also a very early text, now remembered in the uh, Mahayana scriptures, but it's a very early text, a Life of the Lord Buddha, the Lalita Wistara, which I've made uh, translations from before. It's a very interesting text. Then it said a different story is told, and I think this story also some of you will know, and it's of quite of interest. So while the Bodhisattva was sat under the Jambu tree, it said that he looked around, and then he saw worms crawling on the ground. Yeah. And 
Frogs came along and ate the worms. And then birds came along and snatched up the uh, snatched up the snakes like this and he got an insight you see into the dukkha nature of existence at that time of course not fully developed as it would become later but it's like the first real insight into the nature of life and everything yeah so I think it's an interesting uh, story because of this uh, thing. On the one hand, in the Pali texts, then it's told that he attained jhana, which is one step towards getting clear vision of reality. In the other text, it's told that he had his first insight into the nature of reality, like this. Later, of course, as you know, then the Bodhisattva, still the king was trying to protect him from, uh, you know, from the uh, realities of life, if you like. And he married him to Yasodhara. Yasodhara is actually his cousin. But cousin marriages, first cousin as well, but cousin marriages were quite common amongst royalty in those days. So he married his cousin, Yasodhara, and as you know, he had these three wonderful palaces, one palace for the rains, rainy period, one palace for the uh, winter period, one palace for the summer period. And he was kept in a life of real luxury, everything that he wanted, all the sensual pleasures, that he could possibly desire were there for him at his fingertips. Beautiful women, uh, wonderful food, complete comfort in different palaces, entertainment of the best kind, all like this. And this is how the king was trying to protect him from finding out about the nature of reality. But one time the Bodhisattva asked whether he could go out in the chariot and s go for a trip into the park. And so the king allowed him to do this. He first cleared everybody out of the park so there's no, uh, there's no sick people no aging people, no dying people around. He cleared all the streets and then he allowed the Bodhisattva to go out on the trip. But the Devadutas, the Devas who knew that it was time for the, Lord, for the Bodhisattva to attain awakening, they came down from heaven and one of them appeared as an old man in front of the Bodhisattva. Now it said only the Bodhisattva and the charioteer could see the old man. The other people in the around the town couldn't see, but the Bodhisattva could see and the charioteer could see. So the Bodhisattva asked, he had never seen an old man before and he asked the charioteer about this old man and said what is this person or what is this being who is bent over and is in such a decrepit state like this and the charioteer explained this is an old man this is a, you know, this is an old man, he's grown old and he's grown decrepit, he's bent over, his hair is grey, his teeth are broken, his skin is wrinkled, like this. And the Bodhisattva asked, is this a special sort of being or does this happen to everybody? And the charioteer told him, this is not special, this is what happens to everybody. Everybody grows old, as long as they live long enough, of course. Everybody grows old, everybody gets grey hair, 
Everybody gets broken teeth. Right? Everybody gets wrinkled skin. Everybody gets bent over so they're tottering about and can't walk properly like this. And then the Bodhisattva was astonished because he hadn't realized this before. And his mind was disturbed by what he had seen. And he said, charioteer, charioteer, don't take me for this uh, trip into the garden anymore. Take me back to the palace. And so the charioteer turned the chariot round and took him back to the palace. And the Bodhisattva was very pensive, very thoughtful. And the king was also very disturbed to see how the Bodhisattva had reacted like this. He asked for more sensual pleasures to be made available to the Bodhisattva so that his mind would be taken off these things that he had seen. Between these four journeys, there's four months. Okay, it's also important because of the timing you see. The first trip was at Asala, and then four months later, which would be uh, Komuda, uh, full moon night, then he went out on the second trip. And on the second trip, he saw a sick man, a man who had got fever, who was uh, obviously unwell, and he was sweating and in such a terrible uh, physical state and again he asked the charioteer you know what is this and he told him it's a sick man and he asked does everybody become sick and the charioteer told of course everybody will get sick at some time or another this is nature is like this everybody is subject to sickness and the Bodhisattva was again very disturbed by what he'd seen and he told the charioteer, please take me back to the palace. And he went back to the palace. Four months later, he came out. And again, the Devadutas produced the vision of a corpse. Somebody who was dead. He had never seen anybody who was dead either. And he asked the charioteer, is this a special being? Is this something? No. No. This is not a special being. All beings have a lifespan and they come to, at the end of their lifespan, everybody dies. The Bodhisattva himself will one day die. Yeah. Again, he was very disturbed, you see, and he was taken back to the palace. And the king each time is trying to increase the sensual pleasures and trying to distract him. Yeah. You can understand this story, you know, as a metaphor. In a way, it's a metaphor. While we're enveloped in sensual pleasures, we don't actually see the reality around us. The realities are that people are growing old. The realities are people are growing sick. The realities are people are dying. But occupied with sensual pleasures, yeah, we don't we don't look at that. We look at the sensual pleasures instead. Yeah. We don't want to see about people dying. Or if we do, we don't feel like it applies to us. Dying, of course, is something that always applies to somebody else. You don't see it applying to yourself. You see it applying to somebody else like this. So in a way, it's like a metaphor. And the charioteer, you see, is like a metaphor of the intelligence. Yeah. He's asking his buddhi, his intelligence, about this thing. And he's saying... He sees somebody who is sick and he asks his higher intelligence, does this apply to me? And the charioteer, his buddhi, tells him, this applies to you. 
he sees an old man. Does this apply to me? And he understands this applies to me. A dead man, this applies to me, you see. It's the higher intelligence giving him insight into the nature of the world. Or at least this is the way that you can understand it anyway, as a metaphor um, uh, on one level. And then the fourth time that he went out, which was on the following Asala, that's July, full moon night, he saw an ascetic. First time he'd also seen an ascetic. And he asked the charioteer about the ascetic. Who is this person wearing different clothes with his head shaved? What is he doing? Because he had never seen before. And the, uh, and the charioteer explained to him that an ascetic is somebody who is engaged in good deeds only. And meditation, the development of the higher faculties, like this. And then the Bodhisattva understood that there was a different way of life. Not only a life of fulfilling sensual pleasures, but there was a way of living a life as an ascetic, doing only good deeds, engaged in meditation, being careful about precepts and so on and so forth. So this was the fourth Devaduta that the Bodhisattva saw. And he went back to the palace. And then when he was in the palace, at night, he's thinking about all these sights and these insights that he's had. And uh, the girls, the dancing girls who were supposed to be entertaining him, saw that he was no longer interested and they just kind of fell asleep. They were no longer uh, uh, playing their instruments and dancing. They fell asleep. And it says, said that, you know, when he looked at them, it was like looking at a cemetery. These women were laying on the floor, some of them all disheveled, with their hair all over the place, with saliva dribbling out of their mouths, with sweat under their armpits, and just lying there like corpses in the palace. And he was repulsed by what was supposed to be bringing him sensual pleasures, he now saw in a different light. Yeah. And then, you can say, he made up his mind that he himself must go forth from the home life into the homeless life. And he himself must become an ascetic. So he went to see his wife and his wife that night indeed had given birth to their son and he opened the door and he saw his wife holding his son to her breast like this and his natural urge was to go over and just to hold his wife and to hold his baby yeah, before he went forth. But he knew if he did that, then there was a chance his wife would wake up and then he would not be able to overcome his attachments. So rather than going uh, over to his wife and child, he quietly closed the door and uh, went out of the palace to the stall where Channa and Kantaka, Channa is the groom, Kantaka is the horse, were waiting. And he asked to be taken out of the palace, out of the city, and he would go forth on his great renunciation. So that's at the Asala full moon night. You know, when we think of Asala, 
in July, we think of Dhamma Chakka Bhavatana Sutta. Yeah. But other events took place on that night. One is the great renunciation. So, Channa and Kantaka were ready and the prince got on the back of Kantaka and they were going out. But there was some fear that Kantaka, who was a, a great and marvelous horse, because of his neighing and because of the way that you know, he uh, runs with his feet pounding on the floor, he might wake somebody up. So the devas came and they put down their hands underneath the horse's hooves so that nobody would hear him, so that he could go out of the city quietly. And then when they got to the gate, they uh, were ready to jump over the gate. The Bodhisattva thought, I will just grip the horse and I will jump over the gate. And Channa thought, I will take the horse and I will jump over the gate. And Kantaka himself, the horse fell, thought, I will take the Bodhisattva and we will jump over the gate. But the devas opened the gates for them. And so they were able to go out without being heard and without disturbing anybody. And then, in fact, Mara appeared uh, and said to the Bodhisattva, don't go forth, don't go forth on this great renunciation. In seven days itself, then the a uh, sign of the Chakravati will appear and you will be anointed as the king. If you don't go forth, you will become the universal monarch, the one appointed to be the universal monarch. But even at that time, the Bodhisattva would not listen to Mara. And he put Mara aside and he carried on on his great renunciation. And he went south actually from Kapilavatu. Kapilavatu is where the, uh, where the palace was. He went south from there and he went through the Sarkian country. The Sarkian is his own people. He went through the Kolian uh, country. I told you last time about the Kolians and the Sakians nearly got into a war. He went through the Kolian country and he went through the Malian country as well, going south, ever farther away from his home. And then he got to the river Anoma. And when he got to the river Anoma, the horse he was still on the horse, jumped over the river in one swoop and landed on the other side. And then you see the Sarkians, the Kolians, the Malians, they're all related groups. But on the other side of the river, he was away from his relatives at that point. Yeah. And it's there that he took his sword that you will see in many of the representations. He took his sword in one hand and he took his hair in the other hand and cut off his hair at that point. And two miraculous things happened. One thing is, if you look at the Lord Buddha now, you'll see that his hair is all in ringlets. From the time that he cut off his hair at the uh, Great Renunciation, his hair turned into these ringlets like they are now, uh, turning to the right, and his hair never grew again. He never cut his hair for the rest of his life. His hair stayed like this. And the hair that he cut, up, cut off, he threw into the sky. And Saka, the lord of the guards from Tarvatimsa heaven, Saka caught the hair and it's the first real relic that is taken. And he took it back to 
Tava Timsa heaven, and there he built a Chaitya for it. Yeah. That Chaitya is still now in Tava Timsa heaven. It's the first actual Chaitya. Afterwards, uh, uh, Gatikara Brahma, who was also a very important uh, Brahma god, then he came down with the requisites that were necessary, the eight requisites that are necessary for an ascetic. It means the robes and the bowl and the belt and the uh, razor and so on and so forth like this. So Gatikara uh, Brahma brought these, re uh, brought these requisites to the Bodhisattva. And the Bodhisattva took off his clothes that he had been using. The Brahma took the clothes up to the Brahma heavens and then built another Chaitya in the Brahma heavens. That is called the Dusa Chaitya. It means the clothes Chaitya. Yeah. So that is the second relics. Those are relics of use. Yeah, the first relics are relics of the Buddhas or the Bodhisattvas in this case. Bodhisattva's body, but the second one are relics of use. Okay, Channa and Kantaka went back to Kapilavastu uh, and then gave the um, gave the uh, information to the family. But Kantaka, the horse, was so upset by losing his master. He died on the way. Uh, then the Bodhisattva spent seven days on the other side of the river Anoma. And then after that, he pursued his southward course. And that's when he came to Rajagaha. Rajagaha is one of the main uh, pilgrimage sites now in India and you can still see um, fortifications of Rajagaha from Lord Buddha's time if you go there you can still see those fortifications they still exist so he went to Rajagaha which was the capital of Magadha and King Bimbisara was there and then he went out on arms round in Rajagaha and the king King Bimbisara, who figures so largely in the suttas, in the early suttas, saw the Bodhisattva and he was very, very impressed by seeing this ascetic. And he's going on Pindapat and he has total control over his faculties, just looking sufficiently far ahead, not looking round, not attracted by sense objects, very calm in his demeanor, very uh, wonderful presence and bearing that the Bodhisattva had. And then he asked his ministers to find out where this wonderful being was staying. And his ministers followed uh, the Bodhisattva back to Mount Pandava. Around Rajagaha there are mountains. So one of those mountains is called Pandava. And then he followed the Bodhisattva back to Mount Pandava and Bimbisara himself came out in his chariot as far as the chariot would take him and then he climbed the mountain and he met with the Bodhisattva and when he met with him he offered him half of the kingdom such a noble being you see and he out offered him half of the kingdom from the mountain they could see the kingdom of Magadha and the Bodhisattva again you see was not tempted by glory and fame and wealth and honor he was intent on his quest for awakening and he turned the king down but the king told him you know when you do attain awakening you must come back to Rajagaha and give me teachings later the Bo Lord Buddha 
would fulfill that request later in the story. So, after that, he went even farther south from Rajagaha. He went down to the area around Gaya, which is south of Rajagaha. And it's there that he met Alara Kalama, who was his first teacher. And Alara Kalama was a very highly developed ascetic who had attained the first seven jhanas, what we now explain as the first seven jhanas, Akinchayatana is what he had attained to. These spheres, we say the four spheres and the four jhanas. So this was the third uh, sphere of nothingness. And in a very short time, the Bodhisattva also attained Akinjayatana. He was also able to attain to such a high level of meditative attainment. And Alara, who was a very uh, highly developed person himself, you know, wasn't filled with envy or jealousy or fear about the Bodhisattva, but his heart was full of generosity. And he offered for the Bodhisattva to be his co-leader of the group. It's a very wonderful thing if you think about it. You know, sometimes when people are kind of coming up, and especially coming up quickly, then people, you know, want to put them down or chase them out or not have anything to do with it. But our Lara, you see, really had a lot of kusala, really had a lot of wholesome mind states. And he wanted to have the Bodhisattva as his co-teacher. But the Bodhisattva knew that our Kinjayatana, it doesn't lead to awakening. It isn't the final attainment. It isn't enough. And the quest was for awakening, you see. So he said, you know, it is not sufficient for attaining awakening. And he left from Alara's group. And he went and found the second, uh, the second group, which was Ramaputta's group. There's a lot of confusion about Ramaputta. Ramaputta's, Ramaputta means Rama's son. That's what it means in the Pali. Actual fact, Rama himself had attained the higher level of meditative attainment, nevasanya nasanya ayatana, like this. Uh, but Ramaputta had not attained to that level. Rama had passed away. But they knew the teaching. So Ramaputta explained the teaching to the Bodhisattva. And the Bodhisattva attained to that high level of uh, meditative attainment. And Ramaputta didn't say, come, we'll be leaders together, because Ramaputta himself was not at that level, you see. So he said to the Bodhisattva, you lead the group, you be in charge of the group. But again, the Bodhisattva understood and knew, this is not the end, this is not the fulfillment of my quest, this is not awakening. Yeah. So he left from that group, he left from that group as well. And then he went out into the forests in Gaya and began, began his period of austerities. Now his austerity periods were really uh, tremendous feats of endurance, you can say, when he was doing his Dukracharya his period of strenuous um, asceticism where he was eating so little yeah. 
they say so little that when he touched his belly button he also touched his spine yeah. because there was nothing there was nothing no meat or anything between the if you think about it you might have seen pictures like pictures of people in Ethiopia during the great famine in the 80s yeah and you can see that actually does happen if you be, if you starve sufficiently you know there's nothing left in the belly you've seen pictures of children in this state and really terrible thing of course so the uh, bodhisattva practiced these austerities and some days he would take four beans but the next day he would take just two beans and the next day he would just take one bean and it's not sufficient for uh, uh for sustenance so he became you'll remember that there's this uh this very famous uh statue of the duke duke acharya time and it's kept in lahore in pakistan now as a bodhisattva really drawn away with his uh, uh all his hair rotting away and his skin uh, in a very bad condition like this but also not only did he restrain his food but he also restrained his breath as well so he would hold his breaths so that he was virtually keeling over because he wasn't getting any breath and the guards were unsure whether he was still alive or not going through these austerities and they had to inquire whether he was still living or whether he had actually passed away because he had um, uh, overdone the austerities 6 years he was engaged in these austerities it's a really really long time in the uh, traditional teachings they tell uh, that there was a reason why he had to spend so long not all bodhisattvas spend 6 years but our uh, lord buddha lord buddha gotama he had to spend 6 years uh, in his dukkharacharya and then he remembered at that time the period when he had been sat under the rose apple tree and he realized uh that that actually was the path to awakening that jhana that he had got at that time led to uh awakening and he realized while he was exhausted as he was at that point he could not get stable mind he could not get as as a, a stable and concentrated mind and so he decided to go on arms round uh in the nearby village of sania and he went out on arms round it's when he went out on arms round that the group of five ascetics who had been uh attendants on him they saw that he was taking food again and they thought he's just given up he's given up there's no point in uh carrying on anymore and the ascetics in disgust they left because he'd given up on what he had been attempting to go do and they left him at that point one thing i want to say by the way is you know earlier he had attained these jhanas with alara and udaka yeah and now he attained just the first jhana but it was different jhana you see the jhanas that he had attained with the two great teachers were simple concentration jhanas whereas the jhana that he had attained uh when he was a boy was based on mindfulness and insight and it's mindfulness and insight that leads to awakening that is the difference between those two jhana states you see it wasn't simply a jhana state but a giant jhana state based on mindfulness of the body anapana okay 
So that just clears one of these things up about this um, attainment. Then one morning he went out and he was sat under a tree and Sujata came out and uh, she had been accustomed to giving uh, offerings to a tree some time before, actually it must have been 21 years before, she had gone to that tree and she had made an offering and she had said, if my offering is worthy, then may the tree deva bless me with a child. And she had become pregnant and she had given birth. She actually gave birth to Yasa. Yasa is the sixth person to attain awakening later. Okay. Uh, that is Sujata's son. But every year, because she had made this vow, she went out and she made offerings at the tree. And then she gave offerings of milk rice to her servant, Punya, and Punya took it to the tree. And when she, gave, when she came to the tree, she saw the Bodhisattva and she thought it's the tree deva come out of the tree and sat at the bottom of the tree. So she came back to Sujata and said, the tree deva has come and is sitting at the foot of the tree. And so Sujata herself came and then she gave this milk rice to the Bodhisattva. Forty-nine pindas, forty-nine rice balls were in this uh, in this offering that she gave, which was one rice ball, if you like, for the next 49 days that he would spend when he didn't eat after he attained awakening around the Bodhi tree. And then after he had taken these uh, pindas, after he had taken, that's where we get the word pindapat from here, yeah? pindachara, pinda is a rice ball. Okay, so when he had taken these rice uh, balls and he had finished, he took his bowl and he made a determination. He said, if I'm to attain awakening today, may this bowl float upstream. And he threw the bowl into the stream and the stream's coming this way and the bowl flew upstream or went upstream like this and it's like a confirmation a supernatural confirmation that he also would go upstream you see to awakening so from there he moved towards the bodhi tree which is you know the bodhi tree at what we now call bodhgaya and as he was going, he met a Brahmin uh, grass cutter called Satya. And Satya gave him eight handfuls of kusa grass. Kusa grass is very fragrant grass. In fact, even today in India, they will use kusa grass uh, at the sacrifices, the Brahminical sacrifices. But they also use it around the house to keep away mosquitoes and creatures like this. It's a very fragrant grass. So he gave this grass and the Lord Buddha took it and he threw it at the foot of the Bodhi tree and as it landed at the foot of the Bodhi tree it turned into a diamond throne. The Vajrasana. Yeah, what we now call the Vajrasana. The diamond throne underneath the Bodhi tree, where the Lord Buddha sat. And he made this vow, you know, may my skin dry up, may my bones become dust, may my, my sinews and flesh just dry up, but I will not rise from the diamond throne until I have attained awakening. And then Mara, old Mara, 
who had been following him for six years from the time that he had gone on from gone out from his renunciation looking all the time Mara was looking for unwholesome thoughts of sensuality unwholesome thoughts of hatred or anger unwholesome thoughts of delusion to appear in the Bodhisattva's mind he had been chasing him and looking for these for six years and had not found them so Mara knew that the Bodhisattva was on the verge of awakening and he decided he must bring all his powers to bear to prevent the Bodhisattva from attaining awakening which would lead to the release of beings from samsara which were under Mara's sway so he brought all his armies devas of various sorts to attack the Bodhisattva and he stirred up cyclones to attack the Bodhisattva and he turned he uh, brought out tsunamis to attack the Bodhisattva and he threw stones and rocks to attack the Bodhisattva and he threw weapons at the Bodhisattva and hot coals were thrown at the Bodhisattva and hot sand and hot mud were also thrown at the Bodhisattva and at the end he brought darkness all over the earth to try to prevent the Bodhisattva from attaining awakening but none of these things were sufficient to put the Bodhisattva off his quest for awakening and the Bodhisattva of course during all this period four immeasurables hundred thousand aeons such a long period had fulfilled the paramis generosity virtue uh, renunciation wisdom energy patience truth determination loving kindness and equanimity he had fulfilled all these paramis and he was ready for the time of awakening and he called on the earth to bear witness that he was worthy to be sat on the Vajrasana and the earth bore witness to the Bodhisattva and Mara was overthrown and was washed away along with his hordes and the Bodhisattva was left at the end of the day on the Vesak full moon day sitting at the foot of the Bodhi tree and then during the night in the first watch of the night he attained Pabhenivasanusanana which is knowledge of his previous lives he remembered all the previous lives that he had uh, been through he knew what his name was he knew what his family was he knew what his position in the society was he knew what food he had eaten he knew what pleasure and pain he had experienced and he knew what lifespan he had attained and he remembered one life and he remembered two lives three lives four lives five lives ten lives fifty lives a hundred lives a thousand lives, ten thousand lives, a million lives, a billion lives, tens of thousands of billions of lives he could recall and he knew what his name was, he knew what his family was, he knew what his position was in all of those lives he gained complete insight into his journey through samsara in the first watch of the night and in the second watch of the night he attained to uh, the Dipachakunyana the Dipachakunyana is knowledge of the rising and falling of beings according to their actions good and bad so he saw that certain 
beings had made good actions and had got good results, good rebirths, and other beings had made bad decisions in their lives and they had got bad rebirths because of it. So it's an insight into the workings of Kama and Vipaka and how that affects rebirth. Yeah, it's a really deep insight into the nature of reality. That was the second insight that he got on the night of awakening. And the third insight that he attained is Asavakya Jnana, which is when he realized the truth of the Four Noble Truths, suffering, the arising of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and what was the path to the cessation of suffering. And then when he knew the Four Noble Truths, at that time he had destroyed the pollutants, the Asavas. He had completely destroyed the Asavas and he had awakened to full and complete Sambodhi, total awakening. Uh, just before dawn on Vesak night, which was a Wednesday, 588 BC. So that was the awakening of the Bodhisattva. Following the awakening, because we now have to move on to the Parinibbana, Many events followed, of course, that you're aware of, but I can only summarize some of these events. He spent seven weeks around the area of the Bodhi tree, one week under one tree, another week under another tree. And then Brahma Sahampati appeared to him and requested the Buddha to go and preach the doctrine. And there was some hesitation, but he agreed. He saw with his insight that some people are ready for awakening. And so he agreed to go and uh, give his teaching. And he walked over to Banaris, most specifically to Isipatana or Sarnat. And there he preached the Dhammachaka Pavatana Sutta on the Asala July full moon night and then in that rains retreat the rains retreat follows the july night of the july full moon night in that rains retreat yasa sujata's son who we had met earlier in the story came out from uh, baranasi and he attained awakening and then his friends came out uh, 55 of his friends came out and they attained awakening and at the end of that range retreat there were 61 arahats in the world and the Lord Buddha sent them out in different directions to go and give the teachings uh, to the people for the happiness of people you know, for the welfare of all beings and he himself headed back towards Gaya where he had attained awakening. He met with the three Kasapa brothers. He converted the Kasapa brothers and the, their thousand disciples. And with that thousand disciples, he went into Rajagaha to fulfill his promise to King Bimbisara. And he gave the teaching to King Bimbisara. King Bimbisara also attained uh, to uh, stages of awakening. And then from there, he went to Kapilavattu, eventually went to Kapilavattu. And as we saw uh, a couple of months ago, that was on also on Vesak full moon day, when he arrived in Kapilavattu and gave teachings to his family, and then his family, his father, and then his um, brother, and then his uh, uh, son, and uh, also, uh, for that matter, his sister and uh, other members of his family 
also were brought into the Sangha and attained awakening. Right now, for 45 years, the Lord Buddha was giving his teachings throughout ancient India, traveling by foot all the time to different places to see different groups. He taught kings and queens, but he also taught outcasts and beggars. Yeah. He ta taught merchants the rich merchants and treasurers that were there in this newly budding uh, society. And he also taught the workers, the people who were at the, the lowest p uh, position in society. He taught Brahmins, as I've said before, the majority of the early members of the Sangha were actually Brahmins, the educated classes. And he taught the other ascetics as well. Many ascetic groups were also around during uh, Lord Buddha's time, wanderers and jainas and so on and so forth. And the Dhamma, you know, that he taught, uh, it's collected in about 17,000 suttas, 17,000 uh, teachings that come down to us from the Lord Buddha collected in the Sutta Pitaka at present. And as it works out, it's about one teaching for one day. But some of those teachings are enormous. Some of those teachings are very, very long. 100 pages or more in translation. Yeah. Some, of course, are only short as well. So there are also short teachings, just a paragraph and whatever like this. But the suttas uh, are what constitute the uh, teachings that come down to us. And it's like an enormous multifaceted diamond. Just like all of these things connect up in the Lord Buddha's lives, as, uh, you know, in the Bodhisattva's life, lives and in the Buddha's life, all these people are joined up together in certain relationships and everything like this. When we read the Lord Buddha's teaching, it's like looking at a multifaceted diamond. And you look at it from this angle and it tells you one story. And you look at it from that angle and it tells you another story. And you look at it from another angle and it tells you another story. But all the time it's telling you about the reality of life on earth and uh, how it arises, how it ceases, and the path to get to the cessation. So the Lord Buddha's teaching is really, really a wonderful thing uh, that's unparalleled in human teaching. Even today when they've got video recordings and all this sort of thing, we don't get so many teachings from, you know, from these gurus and all the rest of it, and these uh, Acharyas and Ajans and all this sort of thing. The Lord Buddha's teaching is an incredible uh, gift to the world, explaining the path in its different facets uh, from different angles. Now the Lord Buddha spent the first 20 rains retreats in different places. But after the 20th range retreat, when he was about 55, from that time onwards, for the next 24 years, he spent those, those years at Sarvati. And now when we look at the Sutta Pitaka, we find that most of the teachings, but not, not by any means all, but maybe 40% of the teachings or 50% of the teachings actually come, are actually positioned at Sarvati. Yeah. It must have been a major uh, teaching center. There were major monasteries there that Anatta Pindika had built for the Lord Buddha and that uh, Visakha had built for the Lord Buddha. And he alternated, not quite alternated, but he spent some of the, those range retreats at Anatta Pindika's monastery, Jaitavana, and he spent some at the Eastern Monastery, which was Visakha's monastery. But the last range retreat he didn't spend at Sarvati. He came down to Vaisali. 
and he spent the last range retreat at Beloa, which is just outside uh, Vesali. Vesali is the capital of the Lichavis kingdom. Okay. After the rains retreat, he started a walk, which would be the last walk, the last charika that he would make. And he started walking north, back actually towards Kapilawattu, which was his hometown. But very slowly he was walking, still giving teachings along the way. Those teachings are recorded now in the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, which records the last year of the Lord Buddha's life. Yeah. And during that period, he was giving the last teachings that were to be given to uh, the Sangha, specifically, and to the four assemblies as well. Because during the rains retreat, the Lord Buddha had fallen ill with dysentery. And he was very, very weak and very, very ill. But he suppressed that illness. And he managed to suppress it for about nine months. He suppressed that illness because he needed to give the final teachings to the Sangha and to the Chattuparissa, the four assemblies. So he started on this long last walk in towards the Himalayas in, uh, in what was Jambudipa in those days and given these various teachings along the way. And when he got to Pava, there he met Chanda the smith. And Chanda was the person who made the Lord Buddha's last meal. Yeah. There's disputes, as you know, about this last meal. But in the Pali, it quite clearly says that the last meal that was offered to the Lord Buddha was tender pork, like this. There are other things. Sometimes they want to say that it was the five products of a cow or an elixir of life or bamboo shoots that had been trampled down by pigs or mushrooms. But in the Pali, it says, uh, uh, it says very clearly that it was uh, tender pork. And the Buddha ate this tender pork and after he had taken the meal, he fell ill. As I've explained before, the commentaries are at pains to point out that the meal did not cause the illness, but after the meal he fell ill. So you have to fall ill at some point. It was after the meal that he fell ill, not because of the meal. He had already fallen ill nine months before. And three months before this point, he had already given up the will to live on yeah. at the uh, Marga full moon night. So he told Ananda he wanted to go to Kusinara. And Ananda said, why go to Kusinara? Kusinara is just a small town, just an insignificant town. It's not a worthy place for a Buddha to pass away. And the Buddha explained that what was now Kusinara had been a great city in previous times. And it was a city where Mahasudasana, which was the Bodhisattva himself, had been a great king and he had lived there and he described the glories of Kusinara in the uh, previous times and that it was really a place worthy of a Chakawati king 
a universal monarch to uh, be li- to have been living and he had been that universal monarch mahasudasana it now forms the mahasudasana sutta in diga nikaya diga nikaya 17 one of the long discourses of the buddha and then when he got to just outside uh, kusinara he lay down between two sala trees previously when he had been born he had also been born under a sala tree when mahadevi had held the branch of the tree that was the sala tree and now between two sala trees he lay down on his final resting place and the devas from all over the universe assembled around the brahmas came down all from the heavens all the devas and the uh, brahmas and all the celestial beings of great power came down and they rained down flowers and perfumes over Lord Buddha at that time but the Lord Buddha said this is not how I am worshipped when I am properly worshipped I am not properly worshipped by the offerings of flowers by the offerings of incense by the offerings of scented water I am properly worshipped when people understand my teachings and put my teachings into practice that is the highest worship that you can do of the Lord Buddha is to put the teachings that he had given to you into practice yeah. then Ananda went into Kusinara and he told the Malas of Kusinara that the Lord Buddha was going to pass away on that night and that they should come and pay their last respects do not let it be said that the Lord Buddha passed away in Kusinara and you didn't come and pay respect to him before he before he passed away and so the Malas came out Malas are a people you know the Malas came out and were paying respect family by family to the Lord Buddha all through the night and then a very interesting thing happened one wanderer uh, Paribhajika you see heard that the Lord Buddha who he had never met was going to pass away on that night and he realized it's his final opportunity to come and get teachings from the Lord Buddha who he had heard about but who he had never met so he came and he told Ananda he wants to meet the Lord Buddha and Ananda said seeing that he's a member of a foreign sect you see an outsider he said no do not bother the Lord Buddha when he's lying on his deathbed and Subhadra said but this is my last chance maybe I won't be a, get the chance to meet the Buddha again then you must give me permission and Ananda said no you mustn't bother the Lord Buddha when he's lying on his deathbed and a third time he asked for permission and the third time Ananda turned him down and the Lord Buddha said what is it that you're talking about what are you discussing within my hearing and Ananda said there is this outside ascetic who wants to worship you and he said Ananda do not turn anybody away when they want to hear teachings from the Buddha yeah. even now it's the same you see if people come and ask for teachings from the Sangha we never turn them away yeah. we don't turn people away from the teachings of the Lord Buddha and the Lord Buddha as his last act 
would not turn anybody away even though he's preparing for his parinibbana. So Ananda was told to bring Subhadda to the Lord Buddha and Lord Buddha gave teachings to Subhadda. Subhadda was ordained and he attained arahatship and he is the last direct disciple of our Lord Buddha. At the very last moment he got ordination. At the very last moment he attained arahatship. And later in that night then the Lord Buddha attained the first jhana, the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh and the eighth and then he came down through the jhanas back to the first jhana and then he attained the second jhana and then he attained the third jhana and then he attained the fourth jhana and then on the Tuesday night of Vesaka 543 BC the Lord Buddha entered Parinibbana and passed away never to return. After the Lord Buddha had passed away then various people uh, various beings you can say spoke verses over the Lord Buddha's body so one of the pe one of the people was Brahma Sahampati, another was Anuruddha, one of his main disciples, another was Ananda. I can't explain all of these, but one other was Saka, the Lord of the Gods, and he said something which everybody knows, has heard many many times. Anicca vata sankara upada vayadamino upajitwa nirujanti tezan wupasamo suko. Impermanent indeed are all processes. Arisen, they have the nature to decay. After arising, they come to cessation, and the stilling of them is blissful. When we do the chanting, at the coffin when somebody has passed away this is the verse that we chant at that time Anicca Vata Sankara yeah. that's the verse that was spoken by Saka Lord of the Gods when the Lord Buddha passed away at that time and then when the Lord Buddha passed away some of the people who were with him had not attained awakening and they threw themselves on the ground and they rolled around from left to right and they uh, cried and called out too soon has the Buddha left us too soon has the great Samana gone away but others who were Arahats understanding impermanence knew that this is the nature of reality. Whatever has arisen, even Buddhas who have arisen, have the nature to pass away and they didn't grieve over what must be. Okay, so such is the nature of the third event that took place at the uh, Vesak night, that was a Tuesday night in 543 BC after the Lord Buddha passed away, just to uh, bring it to a completion, then there was seven days of mourning and the Malians prepared like a mourning festival for the Lord Buddha and then they prepared the body like they prepared the body of a universal monarch wrapped in silk, 500 cloths of silk were wrapped around the Lord Buddha's body and then they were ready for the cremation 
of the Lord Buddha. But when they took the fire, they could not light the uh, beer. The reason that they couldn't set fire to the beer on which the Lord Buddha was l lying after those seven days was because Maha Kasapa had not come and paid his last respects to the Buddha. So the fire could not be lit until Maha Kasapa had arrived and worshipped with his forehead at the feet of Lord Buddha. And after that, after he had paid his respects, right, the beer spontaneously burned, spontaneously burst into flames, and the cremation took place. And the Lord Buddha had explained that there's four people who are worthy of stupas. Yeah. The four people are Samma Sambuddha, a worthy of a stupa. Yeah. A Pacheka Buddha, who is awakened by himself, is worthy of a stupa. An Arahat is also worthy of a stupa. And a Chakravati universal monarch is also worthy of a stupa. So after the Lord Buddha had been cremated, they collected the relics, the bones and ash that was left over from the cremation. And then there was nearly a war broke out over these relics because Ajatasattu was sent from Magadha and said, you know, I am a Kshatriya and the Lord Buddha was a Kshatriya. I am worthy of having those relics. You must give them to me. But the Vaisalians also wanted the relics. And the Kapilavati and Sakyan said, it's our relative. It's our son. We want the relics. And the Bulas of Alakappa wanted the relics and the Kolians wanted the relics. And they were almost brought to a war. But there was one Brahmin, Dona, and Dona said, I will split the relics up evenly and then everybody can be satisfied. And what he had collected it in made another relic that was taken away for another site and the ashes were also taken away for another site. So eventually the relics were split into ten sections like this. And it's those ten sections that were later divided up yet again by King Asoka and spread into the 84,000 viharas that he built throughout his empire. Yeah. Even the relic that we have in our relic container here is from Kapilavattu. This relic was actually rediscovered only in about 1971 or something like that. It had been buried in a deep inner chamber where the relic thieves had not been able to find it. Yeah. So those relics and that we have one share of here, uh, actually they're believed to have come to, from the actual body of Lord Buddha at that time. Okay? So everybody say sadhu.